We, we formed uh, Post Kamani in 2006. Is there a lot of reverb in there? Space rock out. We formed in, in 2006. It was really pragmatic. Um, you know, if you're uh, on a number of different levels, um, on one level, uh, if you're doing art that's somewhat, you know, conceptual, um, installation-based uh, work, um, there's just not a lot of funding uh, for developing large-scale projects in in, uh, in the United States, and um, I think we all recognize that. Um, so working collaboratively was was at a very basic level was a way to leverage resources. Um, on a more conceptual level, um, we wanted to address some of the, maybe the history of, of contemporary Indian art. Um, I, I say Indian, you know, because we're, you know, we say we're American Indians. Um, so I guess I'd be like First Nations or something up here. So please forgive, just go with me on that. <laughs> just accept the Indian thing. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, we have the Indian act in Canada, so we're all right. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we wanted to uh, work in a different way. You know, there was a generation that came about in the 80s um, through the multicultural arts uh, uh, in the New York scene, like Edgar Heber Birds and Jimmy Durham and, and folks like that. Um, and um, then there's, like, and there's many more people to mention. Um, then there's like the rest of the field, which is largely market-based, which is really producing um, objects that reflect um, expectations of the consumer for Indian uh, expression, Indian narratives, and Indian discourses. Um, and we really wanted to go and break away from from that. We also wanted to break away from the Jimmy Derms and the Edgar Hubert's because there's one fundamental problem that was you know, across the board, it was uh, a binary of us versus them. You know, if you were to reduce the discourses of those artists, it was always us versus them. And I think fundamentally, we were focused on, uh, I think, not a, a more informed or smarter or whatever, but just different. Um, we wanted to acknowledge that um, it's not us against them, it's us against ourselves. Um, we're all, um, a part of this uh, very vast, multinational, uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic body of people who are a part of this colonizing force. You know, we all opt in through consumerism. We're all active participants in that. So um, there are Indian neoliberalists that are just as hardcore as the biggest you know, neoliberalists in, in, in New York. So it's not, it's really not that simple. And that was kind of a gateway into our art practice of let's take these issues that artists have worked so hard to simplify, let's do the opposite and just make it as complicated as possible. Let's show that it, you know, that everything is truly interconnected. It's a worldview, it's an indigenous worldview, it's a, it's a tribal worldview, it's a charity person. Um, but everything is inherently interconnected. You can't pull yourself away from something else. Um, so we wanted to explore that. And we, we really wanted to focus our lens on the market and look at how the logic of the market and the functionality of the market and the, the interconnectedness that the market creates and promotes uh, for, for better or for worse, and in most cases for worse. Um, and we wanted to look at how this multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, colonizing force um, was engaging indigenous communities and non-indigenous communities alike. Um, and our goal at that time was to look at the whole Western Hemisphere. We haven't got the budget to do that yet, so we're trying to, we're still picking our way through. But that's what really brought us together, was that idea of just opening up the discussion around contemporary indigenous issues away from those, that binary, 
and, and to look at some of the, the larger global issues. And then within that um, theater of globalism, to really um, to think very deeply and very heavily about issues of self-determination, cultural self-determination. You know, the, the tradition of, of, of the American Indian arts um, that came out of, and the, and the conceptual arts and, and everything that came out of the 80s, it, it was all about, if anything, notions of political sovereignty. And political sovereignty was, is an important concept. It's very, very important for self-governance and all those things. But at the root of it is that issue of cultural self-determination, which underlies, um, I think, political sovereignty. So that was something that we looked at. Because you can extrapolate that or disaggregate um, uh, communities or nations or states or provinces and look at the communities and then look at how they're self-determined or how they're trying to actuate self-determination. Whether they're indigenous or not indigenous. You know, Guelph could be a very prime example of that. As a smaller town um, outside of Toronto, a major international city that has always had elbows to throw around. You know, Guelph has always had an identity of itself. You know, it's a very free thinking, you know, creative type of place, you know, a place that respected, you know, the, the political process and, and um, political expression, even um, in times when it wasn't welcome. So those types of issues of, of cultural self-determination um, could be extrapolated to, to think about in terms of wealth, or it could be thought of um, more intimately in terms of a, of a particular tribe or a particular tribal community. So we wanted to get those narratives on the table and um, let them interact with those larger global discourses. Um, yeah, I, I think I can expand on <coughs> what you said once, as we move okay. through the slides, there's, yeah. And we're gonna, we're just, we're gonna, uh, we're not gonna talk about all these pieces but we're, we're gonna, you know, um, scroll through them. Uh, but this is something that, that is gonna come up uh, later on. Um, earlier, <coughs> Alyssa mentioned the, uh, the repellent fence. Um, in 2006, or 2007, really, that was really when, when that idea, um, you know, was, was first, you know, came about. And um, just to give, this is, uh, one of the vinyl spears that will that, that comes up that becomes the, the repellent fence. But this is in uh, downtown Phoenix. So, um, okay, this this piece is titled "Do You Remember When?" and was installed at um, Arizona State University Art Museum. And um, what it is, is it's uh, a hole in the floor, as you can see, with the slab uh, mounted on top of plinth. And uh, what you're also looking at is, uh, you're looking at, a, so it's like a plumb bob, that's a, a microphone that's hanging from the ceiling, uh, listening to the earth. Um, we, uh, we have more recently had uh, an opportunity to restage this piece. And, um, and I want to talk more about this scenario. Here's this, the piece again. Uh, this time uh, it's installed at the Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney for the 18th uh, Biennale of Sydney. And so um, with our pieces, um, like going back to, to what Kate was saying, that you know, a lot of, a lot of our work is about um, um, going to sites and um, trying to create uh, interventions <coughs> that um, that lead to complexity and um, in a lot of uh, ways um, that lead to confusion. Um, and one of the reasons why we do that, we have a very discursive, very rhetorical practice is really designed to um, stimulate dialogues. And we find that 
some of the most interesting dialogues don't come don't come out of um, binary partisan discourse, but they really come out of this very nuanced, very complicated, very contradictory types of discourse. So it's it's, it's um, so I want to talk a little bit about about that in relationship to this piece. Um, so a little bit of the story behind the story. So um, like when we think about the Art Gallery, gallery of New South Wales, um, uh, we got to visit uh, that site um, several months before um, the installation of this piece, uh, during which um, we, um, there was a press release, and I remember arriving there um, at the Art Gallery in New South Wales and um, um, being escorted in and um, being walked through with security and thinking a lot about this idea of security and, and lockdown and surveillance and that happens in a, in, in a gallery, uh, like a national gallery. It made, made me think a lot about, you know, well, what's the U.S. equivalent of uh, this place? And uh, the, the thing that came to mind was uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And if, so if we were to think about, you know, well, what is our gallery in New South Wales? It's, it's kind of like their net. It's like their equivalent of it. And so if you imagine this in your head, you would see a sort of this uh, Greco-Roman architecture. It's a, it's a, uh, a nation state run run institution. It's a symbol of, um, of uh, Australia's national heritage, a symbol of the nation state. It's also a, um, a museum that is uh, implicated in uh, the, uh, in many ways implicated in the erasure of uh, Aboriginal peoples of Sydney. And so, um, so one of the questions that like, um, and the rhetorical questions that I pose moving forward is what exigency would ju justify collateral damage in, um, in a um, sort of a, 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 a crowning jewel of nationalism? Um, and you know, that, that's something that has stuck with me. Um, especially um, when I look back at how well protected that environment was. And so, um, so, so the, the answer to that is it, it, ha it has a lot to do with uh, truth and reconciliation commissions and um, uh, the efforts of uh, Aboriginal peoples of Sydney, the Biennale, um, the government of Australia, and um, us as, as guests in that, in that uh, dialogue that um, we would have an opportunity to create a, a symbol of uh, thought action to address, um, um, to have the opportunity to construct public memory, or should I say to reconstruct public memory for uh, national healing around a discourse of sustainability. So, um, so what, what we're looking at again is um, pretty much the same thing that you saw that took place at Arizona State University, only it's been, re, uh, it's been reimagined in the sense that it looks very similar, but yet it's, it's very different. So uh, what's different about it is um, we had the <coughs> opportunity to um, have some conversations with members of um, Aboriginal, uh, communities of Sydney and um, uh, share our stories of um, uh, colonization, um, get to um, have conversations, uh, uh, share stories, uh, cultural stories with each other, um, have opportunities to try to engage in um, the relationship building process, even though that's not typically how it happens um, with indigenous peoples, because usually re relationship building is a very um, patient process. But in these types of situations, we do the, the best we can. Um, and so what, what's really um, 
what was really uh, great for us is we got to learn a little bit about uh, where our assumptions are for one another. But then we also got to uh, get a sense of what sorts of things we, we have in common with each other. And uh, through, through, that, um, through that dialogue, we, we, we came to, to think a little bit about uh, achieving a few goals. One, um, uh, some sort of repatriation, uh, repatriation of, uh, of um, tradition, um, as you said earlier, memory. But then also to, um, to construct a portal uh, allowing uh, an indigenous worldview into a space that has um, typically kept uh, indigenous voices out, historically kept indigenous voices out. And so, so, you, so what you're seeing is a portal. And as an, as an analog to that, um, what, uh, what the uh, members of the community shared with us is um, there, there are other symbols of subjugation and one, <coughs> one of them uh, that was identified was the didgeridoo. And so the didgeridoo has become this instrument um, for the tourist um, gaze, the tourist um, auditory and visual gaze, and has become sort of a, um, has become a um, known throughout the world through uh, the world beat music. But what, what we learned is that um, a lot of um, some of the uh, traditional uses of the instrument were to um, make animal calls. And so um, what we got to do through this uh, process of dialogue, um, we, we were able to get to a point where um, we got to uh, collaborate uh, with some didgeridoo players who allowed us to record the animal calls. What we did with the animal calls is we, we buried an audio system underneath the, the ground. So what happens is when you approach the piece, you hear um, the, the animal calls emerging uh, through the earth and into the space of the gallery. And so the, the purpose of the microphone is as the microphone is listening to the earth, we, um, we uh, wrote a, a computer software that would then uh, take that live signal and it would delay several tracks, like four or five tracks on delay. And then what we did was um, we had an ambient sound system up top in the canopy. And then we, um, we, we then uh, used uh, an algorithm to kind of push the sound around the room almost as if it was kind of palm and bouncing off walls. And so you, you kind of get this sense when you're in the space that there is this sort of sonic movement um, going, moving throughout and around your body. So you have this sort of ambient experience of music, and then you have a very localized experience as you hear them coming uh, directly from the earth. So then in addition to that, you also have a drone that is emanating from the slab itself. So we put a contact mic on, and we um, and we we uh, abut, uh, an amplifier against it, and then we we tune it into the natural frequency of that slab, and, and then we get this drone, and so that the, the metaphor is a conversation between uh, Western and Indigenous cultures to raise awareness about the importance of cross-cultural dialogue as we move forward. Um, uh, with um, a discourse of sustainability. So uh, the reason why I want to share that story with you is because we, uh, I wanted to be able to give you a little bit of an idea of like what our, what our rhetorical practice looks like, how, how we build local publics, how we organize communities, and how we situate and position ourselves as guests when we visit different places to try to create um, uh, culturally relevant works of art that are meaningful to the communities who host us. Just, like, just a, a couple of points I add to that. I think it's a really <coughs> very good description of the, of the piece. Um, there's one thing that's going back to <coughs> the dudes working in the 80s versus um, what we're trying to do um, you go to a, a place like 
uh, where this piece was originally staged in, in um, Phoenix, Arizona, Tempe, Arizona, Arizona State University, you're surrounded by tribes. And um, a big part of the piece was getting permission to use a, a song. And in that case, it was a Kipash song in, in Arizona. But in um, Sydney, um, it, it, was, it was quite a challenge um, to find a song from a tribe of people um, who were the original you know, stewards of the land there. Um, and the most pragmatic example was just to, to use the, um, the animal calls. Rather than pontificate and point out what's missing, we focus on the generative aspects of that. We focus on what people are still using, what still functions, what still works. And the algorithm that um, we developed for that piece was, it was a generative uh, sound algorithm. So it was constantly evolving, constantly growing. And um, it represented that. So it, it's not a, it's, even though there is tremendous loss um, through the obvious, there's so much else to talk about. You know, there's so much other beautiful things to, to focus on and to think about. We, we try to bring that in in a respectful way, but also try to do a pretty um, serious um, focused intervention that had a lot of political power behind it, which uh, Cristobal talked about uh, really, really articulately. <laughs> My Blood is in the Water, uh, from 2010. Um, this is a series of pieces, there are three pieces. Um, this is in Santa Fe, the uh, Museum of Contemporary Arts. Yeah, it wasn't the dream of Golden Cities, this was the uh, name of the show. And that was, we were commissioned to develop work, a body of work that responded to the 400th anniversary of uh, Santa Fe. Which, you know, the little bit about the 400th uh, history, that was um, the 400 years since what's referred to in New Mexico as La Reconquista. And La Reconquista is the result of a, of a rebel Indian revolt, um, where um, the Spaniards were driven out of northern New Mexico, eventually uh, came back and founded the city of Santa Fe which is an important, you know, it's a colonial narrative that we're, um, that we're situated in here uh, with this work. <clears throat> if history moves at the speed of its weapons, and the shape of the arrow is changing, that's another piece from, from uh, it was the Dream Gold Cities. And um, it's uh, Mother Teacher Destroyer from uh, 2010. And um, as Lisa mentioned earlier, there was, there was a, we were in, included in an exhibition called um, Close Encounters. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the first 500 years or the next 500 years. But, um, something like that. It was about the future and the past. And, um, and the, you know, give you guys like a little bit of uh, uh, kind of some biography too, I guess, about us, because I think it's important. Um, Originally, uh, Postmati was started by myself, Cade, and uh, a Navajo painter named Stephen Yazi. And uh, the kind of the pieces that we just looked at uh, kind of were Yazi was kind of, he's not a member of the collective anymore. Um, he has a, a very, very busy practice and a very, uh, he's, he's involved in, he's finishing, he's in, in school and, and has a family. Um, but as, as uh, post commodity was changing through these years, and these, these are the, you kind of are, are seeing like an influx between these years when, when the Aussie was here and, and when Cristobal came on. But as I said again, this was, this was in a, a very large, um, I, I want to say it's, like, it's, it's, it's not really a survey, but it was in, these indigenous artists from around the world. It was a, it was a really great show. Um, James Luna, uh, Jeffrey Gibson, um, pretty much everybody who, you know, of note in, in, in the indigenous art world. Rebecca Bellmore. Every, every, it was a very large show. George Kwan and all the big shots. 
But we were um, we were able to, and it was uh, plug in uh, Institute of Contemporary Art at, um, in Winnipeg um, was kind of the host institution. Um, the, the the indigenous um, or the, the, the indigenous curatorial collective yeah. were the were the curators of this this show, um, along with uh, I think Anthony Kendall was a, was a curator as well. But um, this was a I'm gonna I'm gonna flip through here and show you a couple of different images of this piece. It's, again, it's not a teacher destroyer. Um, Myself, I, I, I just I kind of um, kind of want to break this kind of down to you know just talk about again just it's a little bit of biography and kind of give you an idea where we were coming from and things. Is, um, growing up, uh, I, I, I'm I'm uh, Pawnee and, and Delaware from uh, Oklahoma. I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but I grew up in Cherokee, in the capital of the Cherokee Nation, which is a place called Tahlequah, Oklahoma. But I was able to. Um, I was, I was lucky enough, I, I guess lucky, but I, I watched uh, gaming become a factor in our communities. The economic, always economic development and tribal self-determination were really these philosophical ideas that were debated and talked about. And the, really the, the, the great wealth and the power of, of a lot of these tribes have amassed, you know, has happened through gaming uh, throughout basically my, my lifetime and I was able to to be in, in Oklahoma, this place where some of the most uh, successful and successful gaming tribes were and became some of the most powerful tribes. But um, what, what was interesting or and I, I also was a, as a young person was able to um, start to watch watch this this wealth <coughs> and, and empower, you know, grow in these communities and um, I was lucky enough as a, as a young person to work at the uh, National Museum of American Indian, which is at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., um, when they were developing the, the, this museum. And um, at the same time, again, this is just kind of runs parallel to the development of you know, tribal gaming and economic development in Indian country. Uh, tribes were really starting to utilize this idea of uh, storytelling and um, museums to, to really kind of own, you know, to uh, have ownership and direction over their stories, their, their history. And um, it, it was safe, it, you know, we would uh, go to these museums and, and you see these dioramas that basically kind of just adopted an anthrop anthropological, you know, point of view to meet their political goals. It was very complicated and, and um, Different tribes have different reasons for wanting to do these things, but um, Mother Teacher Destroyer, this, this piece we're looking at right here, was really kind of about, you know, um, it, was, it was really inspired by these these museums. There's a um, there's a very there's a company called Batman and Robin, and they developed the, the National Museum of American Indians, basically their entire exhibition plan, and they do this for. Um, for all the, the, the wealthy tribes and the, the new museums, and specifically the Chickasaw Nation, just built a new million dollar, around the time of this piece, a uh, multi million dollar museum. And um, so, living and working in Oklahoma, working in, in you know, uh, media, being able to, to be in these, these spaces, um, it just became fascinating to see how uh, tribes were starting to retell these stories. Uh, using this, this new medium and this new storytelling. Um, like I said, we were at um, Postmodi was um, we were able to teach a, a, a summer institute at a plug in Institute of Contemporary Art the the um, the summer before the, this exhibition. Um, so uh, basically the the idea for Mother Teacher Destroyer is um, a tribe who had uh, lot, very, very much had been decimated and had picked up and um, remade culture in a way that, that suited you know their needs. And um, 
just kind of, you know, uh, these, uh, these are instruments <coughs> that, um, that, the, that we have developed um, based on a lot of, a lot of different instruments. This is a, a, dr a drum based on an American Indian Native American church, a peyote drum. It's a harp. This is um, a bass. And this is a cougar pelt uh, synthesizer. And so what you're seeing here is a, um, a composite. This is a, a four-channel video, video installation with the artifacts. We're viewing these, uh, these uh, instruments as artifacts. They were situated around the room. And these, uh, the, the players, you know, um, we're, we're playing the songs that were triggered on, on a four-sided uh, video. Um, like a suspended floating cube. Uh, this is a four-channel piece uh, projection on each side of each of those players. And they were interpreting a peony song that Nathan's uncle wrote, um, and they were just responding to it, playing along with it, it as if they're reinterpreting or reimagining or trying to relearn um, a peyote song. But again, you know, kind of going back, the, the kind of again the basis for this. I mean, we were thinking about a lot of these tribes, and, and one of the ones that I was talking about earlier with these museums. Um, and, and the new museums and the new storytelling was, uh, and, and they're the most uh, wealthy, I'm going to name names here, but not in a bad way or anything, they're the, one of the wealthiest Sami tribes in the country, the, the uh, I think it would be say Nash, Nashantucket Pequot tribes. Um, they, they were really the leader in this, in, in kind of re, retelling their story uh, through their museums to, to really give themselves uh, political legitimacy and able to um, you know reach their goals of uh, economic development through gaming. Also, um, around this time, I, I was um, like I said, I'm, I'm Delaware. We're, we're my father's Delaware. We're from the East Coast. So, um, let's say, let's say compare that to my mother's uh, tribe, who's Pawnee. Uh, we we encountered uh, colonialism and, and Western uh, Western uh, society or, or the Western expansion in the 1600s, whereas the Pawnees did not actually have a treaty with the United States for 200 years. And so when, when you go to one community, it's very much um, uh, homogeneous, I guess. It's very uh, what we call like thick-blooded uh, as a, the Pawnee community. And when you go to <coughs> somewhere like say the, the Pequots or like the Delaware community, somewhere we, we've been uh, living with a, you know, a Western civilization. <laughs> For hundreds and hundreds of uh, more years, um, you have these these uh, really interesting cultural situations where people are uh, adopting things. People, and, you know, culture is alive and moving, uh, changing, and um, th that's that's really what, what what this piece is about. Is that kind of um, kind of salvaging these things and. Uh, these these players in this, there there are all kinds of mythologies uh, for this. Uh, every one of us has our own mythology for this for these uh, for this band. Um, but uh, you know, they're, they're, this is uh, you know also uh, we're getting in some of our, our you know nods to to psych rock and, and noise and other interests and things like that as well. Heavy metal fantasies. Mm -hmm. Very much. So. It was so fun working on the instruments because it was something you, like the the bass instrument with, with the uh, antler headstock. It's like something you fantasize about when you're in the sixth grade or fifth grade. You like write it out on a peachy or something or a folder in school. You know, like show it to your pros and you're like, yeah one day. But, um, there's that too, but there's a couple important things that um, I think that are in this piece that um, Buck really, or Nathan really uh, talked about. And one's 
critiquing ourselves, you know, critiquing Indian people. Um, this is really a critique of tribal specific institutional narratives, you know. Um, a big part of the self determination movement is building the museums. And the goal was to build museums so that they were not natural history museums, right? And what happened though is the tribes are building parallel institutions. They're, they're recreating natural history museums, but just with smaller budgets and they're horribly mismanaged. You know, so um, typically they're, they're, it's, it's detrimental. They use heavily digital, digitally mediated um, diorama type of environments, and they're really, really surreal. You have to be in one to believe it, and that we really wanted to riff on that. And just you know deconstruct those. And put it. The other thing is hacking. You know these. We, we imagine these women as cultural saviors in a way, and they're just hacking shards of of leftover objects from this imagined time in the future, and taking these objects and making them fit the will of their tribe, their people, their cultural identity, their political will, what have you. They culturally, politically appropriated these um, pieces of objects, turned them into instruments, and reinvented music, you know, that type of thing. So those are, that, that concept of hacking, of appropriating, um, is, is really important to the art practice, for sure. And this idea of institutional critique, critiquing institutional narrative, whether it's you know, a, a mainstream or if it's tribal specific or it's intertribal, um, we'll, we'll, we don't uh, hold back. <coughs> yeah. Yes, uh, this, uh, Aniki, thank you. What I'm going to say is maybe just an echo of what you already said. Um, but this idea that there, there's a lot that we do in our practice that is really centered around um, uh, ideological shifts of material culture. So we take a lot of the things that are, you know, these uh, foreign artifacts, um, like, uh, for example, artifacts that come into my community. I'm from northern New Mexico. Uh, these are manufactured artifacts. They don't, they don't necessarily uh, come imprinted with the worldview of, of my people. But what we, what we can do as an act of self-determination is that we can, um, we can create new disruptive innovations by subverting their original intentions. So it's a repositioning, an ideological repositioning, a functional repositioning. And through that, um, we're able to um, we're able to engage in um, uh, new uh, innovative forms of um, uh, symbolism, of pragmatism, and um, that, that's, that's uh, uh, one of the ways that we as a collective exercise our own uh, self-determination as, as a group. That and healthy doses of irreverence. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. well, we're going to do questions at the end, if you don't mind. Did you? No, I would just I would, I would just say a couple of things and just um, we just when when we were really close with the, the curatorial premise, we just decided that we wanted to go hard sci-fi or more sci-fi. And then I just kind of on a lighter note, there, there was a really talented curator that, that pointed out that Walter um, Obadina that uh, that's Raven, it's K, it's Crystal Ball. <laughs> did, did, is there on you? Is that there's not? Okay. Yeah, there is. Is there a sign? But you know what? Are we? Okay. The hot spots. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, it took place on the University of Toronto campus, I think, in the um, in one of their um, churches there, their we call them cha chapels. Um, and um, the history behind the boarding school experience is a history of, of Christianization. You know, they go hand in hand. Um, so it was a nice stage to work with. It was a good medium to work with. Um, and we used the idea of a confessional booth um, to give people who wanted a dialogue with the relationship of, of the, the sacred space of the church and the sacred space where people confess their relationship to their God. Um, but um, we wanted to alter that discourse. It's typically uh, mono-directional discourse in those spaces. And we wanted to create a dialogical discourse. We just wanted to turn the logical framework inside out, flip the script, um, of that space, um, but still work within the parameters that those that space brings to the table. A confessional booth, for one. So the confessional booth, um, which is lit up there, um, it was lit from inside and, and spotlit from without, and it had this really beautiful glow. Um, and there's like a line of you know hundreds or thousands of people waiting to get in. I mean, it's just long, long, long line. It's really neat to watch as an artist. But um, in that booth, what um, we wanted um, First Nations people, non-First Nations people, to uh, share a story, to confess, to sing a poem, read a poem, share a song, play something with a guitar or an instrument, whatever they wanted to do, but to communicate their relationship with that uh, truth and reconciliation um, happening. So we wanted to bring that um, outside of the formal, you know, bureaucratic construct and bring it into the people who were attending the launch. So you have these line of people getting, going into the confessional booth. The confessional booth um, has an FM stereo transmitter there, so their confessions are being broadcast out to the city to like a <laughs> two-mile radius. <laughs> so it was, um, and, and, you know, we had the, the channel that you could tune in on. It was like 88.2 or 3 or something like that, um, whatever was working. And um, so you could walk around that whole unit. You know how they split new launch into different units or quadrants or zones? Yeah. Um, throughout most of the zone, you could hear it. Um, and what that did on the inside, of, of the building inside the church is we had these um, a three-dimensional sculpture constructed from uh, natural fiber ropes, and we were we, we built um, some Ojibwe tribal geometries uh, patterns with the, the sculpture, and because it's truly three-dimensional, it shifts from wherever your vantage point is. So it's it was hard to document in a way that made. Um, as much that looks as clearly like, wow, that, those are tribal geometries. But, um, so they're, they're abstracted and loose, um, but definitely influenced by that. Um, to the natural fiber ropes, we um, attach transducers. Um, so each of those ropes had a transducer on it. On one end and on the other, we had a, um, a contact mic or a piezo mic. Um, and what happened was um, the broadcast was, um, uh, the signal from the broadcast was brought into the room with, with radio, old radio technology. The radio was fed into the transducers. The transducers vibrated the rope. And it did two things at the same time. It brought the voices from the confessional booth into and onto the rope, but at the same time, it created, it was like a low pass filter, so it created like a bass uh, tone. Um, and we could tune the ropes and create slightly different bass frequencies to create oscillations. And so out of this sea of voices talking about their relationship to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we were able to distill it down into this beautiful, you know, very, um, meditative hum, you know, that pure kind of sound. But still, 
you can hear their you know you can hear their voices um, in a very subtle way, and at times when they would get excited, you could hear it clearly. But yeah, but it it, it was a giant low frequency, beautiful sound machine. That's for sure. It, it was a great instrument, really great instrument. Um, I think over that night there were it was like over so almost fifty thousand people that walked into that space. So um, yeah, and and they never stopped um, confessing. So it's probably the largest scale um, social practice piece. But again, it was, it's a script, it's a concept. Everybody brings something to it and, and makes it work. Um, but as um, Cristobal alluded to uh, earlier, um, it's one of those unfortunate instances where you really don't have time to build the relationships that you want to build. You know, you, it would have been great to work with a team of people for a month you know, and, and really go over this. But, um, you know, at New Launch, you have like 24 hours to install, and you have like a few hours to deinstall. Uh, they had to do church there the next day or something. So we had to have that torn down by 7, I think it's 7 o'clock. Um, we were there, so it was just truly a 12 hour performance. So, something that's really, because um, that was really remarkable that at least. My experience with this piece, one of the things that I thought was very powerful were the human, were human beings, bodies in the space uh, with you know, really deep reverence, spreading very deep, very respectful, sitting down, meditating, thinking. Um, but it was interesting because you had sort of like in a way like a like a voice of God or like a divine sound being mediated through uh, through um, indigenous designs. So it's like you're going back to like maybe like Deloria's like God is red kind of discourse, but it, it, it just complicated and really just flipped everything, distorted everything. And, but what it did was it, it created this very, um, very uh, uh, beautiful dialogue, like beautiful symbolic dialogue that people were really responding to. And that is so important. I mean, it's such a chaotic event. You know, y'all all in there, I'm sure, it's down the street. <coughs> everyone, you know, everybody's drunk, everybody's cruising, you know, doing whatever. And, uh, it was a total escape from that. It was the one, like, place of peace that you could find, you know. And that photo was taken before it opened. That was just the some, some, yes, that's what I was, you know, when I remember. That's the city crew right there, mm -hmm. the city. Gallup mm -hmm. Hotel Butchery, it's from the uh, exhibition here at the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. It's a four channel video installation. So there, there's these things and um, there's this uh, phenomenon in uh, North America that we refer to as the non-place. The non-place is like the hotel room. Like if I'm in a ho hotel room in, um, in golf or I'm in a hotel room in out in Mexico, um, if I was um, if I was um, blindfolded and put in either one of those rooms, I couldn't really tell you where I was. There's no sense of regionalism in non-places. Those are like Walmarts, those are, those are sort of like um, franchise, corporate um, uh, architectures. Um, and so um, we, um, we look at, we, we did this, um, this critique of the non-place, which has um, imposed itself upon the sacred ancestral homelands of um, indigenous peoples. And so uh, what we documented is we, we documented a, a, a family uh, preparing meat for a feast. And um, in, in some cases with, with families who 
who live in, in hotels, they, um, you know, they, it's, it's very pragmatic. Um, you, if, if you have to prepare meat, you have to do it, and it has to happen in the, um, in the bathtub, and that's, that's what happens. And the, 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 the message behind this is that um, r regardless of the, um, the uh, regardless of the simulated historical past that is that's part of the cultural industry or the culture industry designed for the tourist gaze, people will continue to use the land in the ways in which they always have. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a four-channel video installation that is um, documenting uh, uh, this uh, ritual. And one of the things about this piece that makes it interesting or unique is that it's something that's very typical, you know, especially for now, as a now old lady butchering sheep, it's, it's something that happens a lot. Um, but if you take that action, that act and put it and pull it out of context into a commercial space and then butcher sheep, it becomes incredibly awkward and violent and disturbing. Um, and that was really the goal, was just to show how awkward it could, it could be. It, it, yeah. 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 So now we're at the, um, this is our final piece that we're going to yeah. talk about tonight. And uh, this is the Repellent Fence. Go back to the, um, go back to the, like, the black one, or the yellow one, the checkers. So the, the Repellent Fence is intersect, is uh, we're, we plan to uh, install the piece in uh, the fall of um, next year, 2014. And it's, um, and it's this uh, ephemeral monument, uh, a fence that is comprised of a series of these what we refer to as scare eye balloons. And um, maybe, maybe talk a little bit about uh, yeah, the this balloon, just what the balloon is. <laughs> I always enjoy hearing this uh, story from Kate. Part of what we do is <laughs> like, <laughs> We take stuff and just make shit up, so. <laughs> That's a pair of with us. But uh, this, is, this is a really loaded semiotic vehicle. I don't know why, but it is, okay. Um, no, in all honesty, it's something that, um, it is. Um, there's concentric circles, there's medicine covers, there is a graphic design, um, that predatory eye, that is one of the oldest, you know, uh, in, in this hemisphere, one of the oldest symbols used by tribal people. You know, it's a really, really old symbol that has traveled from South America all the way up to the Southeast and, and the southern part of the United States today. Um, used by uh, tribal people, the Cherokee people use that symbol, you know, it, which is kind of interesting. But um, primarily through Central America and Mexico. Um, is, is where that would come. It just shows you the trade. Um, the symbols follow the trade. The semiotic languages follow the commerce. And um, it's always been that way. You know, that's why that symbol got to the southeast part of the United States. But this is a, a, a 10 foot um, replica, 10 foot diameter replica of a consumer bird repellent product referred to as a um, scare eye balloon. And you can buy them. They're really cheap. They're about $5.99. And uh, you can hang out your tree and it'll scare away birds for about an hour. And you'll come back and it'll be covered in bird shit. <laughs> so there's something, wonder, there's something wonderfully American about it in the sense that it's embedded with obsolescence. <laughs> it's purely consumerist and it, it really has no function you know, at all other than just purely to be hacked and by semioticians and used for art. So 
Um, that's that's what we're we're doing. So we're trying to use that that idea. The saying is supposed to repel, but it's embedded with obsolescence. So it doesn't really work. It's a consumer product off the shelf, you know, that can have a life other than its intended meaning. And um, it has colors that are Indian medicine colors, colors of power, and it's this very ancient um, indigenous symbol, you know, that is of this hemisphere. So that's what drew us to it. You know, we just were captured by it. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> we were, and we've been staring at this thing since 2006, I swear to God. The first time we saw it, like, and I think it was my, my wife brought one home and I put it out in the tree to get rid of the birds because we have a, um, a fruit tree in the back that the birds, like, you know, Jim is like, hell yeah, party in the backyard. And uh, so we tried to scare away it, but it didn't work. The owls don't work either, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, go ahead. So, anyway, we, we've got, we, we're going to construct this fence with uh, scarab balloons. Um, and um, what we're, we're actually looking at several locations. We're, we've been scouting the uh, U.S. Mexican border for probably a little over a year now. And um, which has been uh, really remarkable in, in terms of um, really um, ha having the opportunity to spend time with the um, the border fence that, and the mil and to experience the militarization of the border and to see how that militarization is connected to paramilitary operations like different types of military training that takes place down in the desert for um, the America's Infinite War on Terror. And so, um, so we, we, um, we have, we've gone on some adventures and have had some adventures. Um, <laughs> um, but um, what, um, what we hope to do with this is we, so, so uh, I live in Arizona. Um, I'm Chicano, I'm a Spiso from Northern New Mexico. Um, my, my father is uh, Tewa Pueblo. Um, my mother is Mestiza Chicana from a, a, a little village that's uh, tucked away called Rio and And um, in, living in Arizona, um, I mean, it King has been, been there for a lot of part, for, a large part of this, we've, we've been seeing these uh, policies that uh, have been about um, shutting down the border, um, uh, restricting um, uh, uh, Chicana, Chicano studies, ethnic studies in public schools, and book banning, and uh, deportations. And, and that what, that, what ha that has done is that um, the media has turned that into this dichotomous um, uh, uh, debate that is, um, be, it just seems to be perpetuating the madness. And so our challenge is to be able to um, to install this sculpture and move it away from a discourse of activism in the sense that it uh, plays into that, um, it plays into that uh, narrative, the anti-immigration, um, pro-immigration narrative. Um, so we want to look at um, we want to look at um, the uh, border discourse through the lens of the uh, indigenous peoples, the tribes that have been bisected, whose homelands have been bisected by the by the physical border itself. And so um, what what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to we're hoping to uh, understand trans border systems. To try to learn a little bit about how uh, borders serve as filters and how they filter bodies and how they filter money and how they filter commerce and how they filter um, uh, all, all kinds of activity, um, state sponsored, corporate spon sponsored, and underground activity. Uh, we want to recover and we, we hope through this project that we'll have the opportunity through dialogues to, um, to uncover indigenous knowledge to uh, generate, we hope that this is a generative piece that will lead to the uh, generative discourse and new knowledge about trans-border systems. 
and we, we want to commemorate um, uh, the, um, the, the uh, connectedness of, of, of peoples, um, whether south of the border or north of the border. We want to acknowledge that um, despite this, um, this um, ephemeral monument of the U.S.-Mexican uh, border that, that uh, we, we acknowledge that, that people are connected. And that we and that we remember the um, the uh, migrations of uh, indigenous peoples um, uh, throughout history who have um, moved um, north and south of these lands for uh, purposes of uh, trade and cross-cultural collaboration. And one of the things about this piece that is interesting um, because when you're down there scouting land or talking with real estate agents, landowners, and things like that, um, it always happens someone will roll up on you that is a landowner who lives there and they'll just sit and visit with you. You know, they're curious, want to know what's going on, what you're up to. And the last time we were there, um, we were, it was it was near um, the San Pedro River, which is the historic. Um, trade route. Uh, since the beginning of time in this hemisphere, people have been following that river north and south. Um, it's a trade route, and that's where Coronado entered the, um, the United States, what is now the United States. Uh, and there's the Coronado National Monument, not too far from there. Um, but that San Pedro River is a, a really beautiful place, and, and we were out there, uh, Raven and I were out there. Um, on a dirt trail, and this guy rides up on a horse, and he just looks like a crazy Arizona, you know, figure, you know, time warp, and uh, he's covered in tattoos, and a uh, really cool guy, really interesting guy, and, and all he wanted to do was point out that if you want to do something here, he, I'm here to help, you know, this looks cool, I like this, but Right up there on that bluff, those people there are, are that's a militia. They're gonna shoot at you if you're here at night. I've never seen them shoot anybody in broad daylight. They shoot people at night, so be careful. And then he throwed off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so, so there's it's it's not it's it's a militarized zone for sure, and there's that intensity. Um, but there's people that hate America just as much as anything else, and they're there to, to kill people. And, um, you know, there used to be, what is it called, the um, Minutemen? Yeah, the Minutemen. But those guys, you know, the Minutemen have, you know, disbanded because of egos and conflicts and no money. Um, but there's still these militias up there that stop out guns and weapons and, and do, they want to do harm to um, people on both sides of the border. So we were, we were warned about that. And the other thing about the militarization, you just have to be there to believe it. Like if you, I've been out there and counted cars. I, I work with the Tonal Occam track in public policy work, um, doing healthcare policy. So I go down there a lot and you can count cars for every 10 civilian car, for every 10 cars you see, seven will be, um, you know, border patrol cars. Three will be civilians. That's the ratio that I've come up with after counting for years. So it is occupied. It is very tense, very hostile, and you get the sense of anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really, really intense anxiety. They have these mobile checkpoints with dogs. Um, they're really, really trying to uh, control that area. And that discourse around that militarization is so intensely focused on nationalism, obviously, Mexico and the U.S. Everything has been reduced to the concept, the conceptual framework of Mexican and American. And that word Mexican is, it's almost like saying shit because it's been, um, it's been destroyed by American popular culture, you know. And it, Yes, sir. It's, a, it's, it's an Indian word um, as well. Mexican. 
of discourse has been radically altered um, by this um, by this this, this theater of, of a border. So it's interesting how something so ephemeral has such concrete consequences. <coughs> Just five minutes. <coughs> yeah, yeah, that was it. <laughs>